happening right now is that science is changing course in a big, big way. We have people like uh, Dr. Hal Putoff publishing an amazing paper in the Journey of the British Interplanetary Society, in the journal, rather, of the British Interplanetary Society, a highly prestigious scientific journal, saying that aliens are not only real but probably here, and that is becoming an accepted idea in science. A lot of other things are com- becoming accepted, too. And now a prominent physicist, Dr. Claude Swanson, who was educated at MIT in Princeton, is asking some very serious questions about the paranormal. It seems that there is a scientific revolution taking place, and I'm very pleased to to welcome Claude Swanson to this radio program. His new book, The Synchronized Universe, a quite amazing compendium of just what science does already know and is no longer ignoring about the paranormal. Welcome, Claude. Thank you, Whitley. Glad to be here. Well, it's really a pleasure to have you and to have this exciting book with you, with us as well. Uh, Claude, it it is huge. And incidentally, folks, his website is www.synchronizeduniverse.com. And Claude, let me, you have obviously spent a great deal of time and effort on this. There are so many remarkable cases and remarkable studies referenced in here. I had no idea how much scientific proof there already was. Uh, well, like for example, let's talk about ESP a little bit just to start off. Exactly. Um, I, I think as a, so sort of conventionally mainstream educated scientist, um, it was really a shock to me when I first began delving into the paranormal, uh, and it really kind of came out of a quest for wanting to understand the universe at a deep level. And I, I loved unified field theory, and I really wanted to, you know, to have a theory that was really satisfying that it pulled things together. And in the mid '80s, um, when I discovered, kind of came across remote viewing. Uh, and I found out that it was real, uh, and it blew my mind because it told me that everything I had learned in school uh, was wrong, was missing some important pieces, and then that sort of started my search, and I was just amazed. Um, the mainstream science is not exposed to the large amount of evidence and the, the number of experiments that are going on around the world, and uh, somehow we have to get a better uh, intercommunication between these different, uh, you know, parts of our of our, of our science. Uh, but in ESP, for example, I mean, the, to me, the, some of the strongest work is done by the Princeton uh, Pair Lab, uh, which is overseen by uh, doctors uh, Brenda Dunn and Robert John. Uh, of course, Bob John used to be head of the engineering department at Princeton, a very distinguished professor, and uh, they have done work for over 20 years on ESP, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cases and experiments uh, with many different uh, participants and their statistics are you know billions and, and hundreds of billions to one that this is a real effect it's not it's not a fluke it's not an accident and that uh, even more remarkably than that this ESP type phenomena uh, does not weaken with distance and it seems to even operate forward and backward in time which is makes it totally unlike any other forces that our science knows about it's it's more like a uh, it's more like a quantum physical reality than it is something in the sort of ordinary Newtonian world that we live in. And what makes to my mind that so interesting is there are experiments taking place in the world of quantum physics now, such as the experiment with entangling entanglement of photons, where two photons that have been uh, together can be split apart. And when one of them is exposed to measurement, no matter how far away the other one is, it immediately responds in the same way, meaning that they are linked in some manner that is faster than light and apparently indifferent to distance. Now, I wonder if there's any evidence as to what ESP is, and could it be somehow connected with this phenomenon? Uh, I I think it probably is connected um, as... As you know, and, and as I sort of make clear in the book, uh, our present science does not have a theory for any of these paranormal phenomena. And by and large, most scientists 
don't even consider there is a problem because they don't know about the evidence. Um, but I, I agree with you that probably a quantum phenomena, quantum entanglement may be one of the phenomena at the heart of an eventual explanation. The, the tricky thing is that quantum entanglement is part of our conventional physics. So if we could explain all of the paranormal by quantum effects, uh, that would make physicists pretty happy because that would mean that conventional physics really has the machinery already to explain the paranormal. The difficulty is that there are paranormal effects that seem to break and defy uh, even quantum mechanics. Uh, for example, one of the uh, one of the central foundations of quantum mechanics is the idea of the uncertainty principle, which says that there's a certain level of quantum noise that's present everywhere, and that's of a fundamental number of the universe. But we find that when many people focus on the same thought, this is, these are there have been uh, various uh, synchronized prayer. Uh, vigils around the world. Dr. James Twyman, among others, has led some of these. Uh, there have been uh, group consciousness experiments, such as the O.J. Simpson trial, when you have millions of people focusing on a single event being shown on television. And when, the, when many, many minds are focused on the same thought, the quantum noise in detectors around the world is affected by this. So even our quantum theory seems to be you know, showing evidence that the mind and consciousness and paranormal effects, uh, you know, alter it in ways we cannot right, right now explain. Well, this is terribly important because harnessing this, it, a big part of harnessing it is recognizing it that it's there, becoming empowered to it. And, you know, you start off your book with a rather remarkable little discussion about a Hopi prophecy and it's really also a discussion about something that we have lost that they perhaps still have access to. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that philosophy and especially where it is, which is a remarkable story. Well, the Hopis have an ancient prophecy and it is inscribed um, in the Southwest on uh, petroglyphs, you know, writings on stone. And the the basic interpretation of the meaning of these petroglyphs is it shows a timeline and it shows uh, humans uh, progressing through time and there are various markers and various predicted events along this timeline and uh, the most recent markers uh, involved World War I and World War II and something that looks like the present day and the human beings are depicted with their bodies and their heads separated from each other, which is interpreted by the Hopis as meaning that our physical awareness and our spiritual awareness are not in communication with each other. We're not really, you know, we're, we're not in contact with our spiritual higher guidance when we make decisions about the physical world. And what the Hopi prophecy indicates is that unless we very quickly uh, reintegrate, bridge this gap between the spiritual and the physical, uh, we're headed toward another period of great destruction. And if you look at the technological weapons we have in our present arsenal, which have been created by our physical science, um, you know, not to mention atomic weapons, but the biological weapons and all sorts of other things that we've created, um, those are things that come out of our physical science, but unless we use a higher spiritual wisdom in how these things are dealt with and how we deal with each other on the planet, uh, this may be exactly you know, the dilemma that we're in right now. and We really need to, uh, be, to, to, to learn again to get access to this higher wisdom. And um, there have been uh, you know, teachings and trainings you know, in, in the past uh, societies that were aware of how important it is to to have access to wisdom and meditation and prayer before making decisions, but our current Western society seems to be sort of based on a materialistic view of the universe, and uh, so that, I suspect this may be exactly the dilemma that uh, we're at right now. It's also based on a tremendously, a, a very, very iffy 
tremendously dangerous assumption, and it is that consciousness and intelligence are essentially the same thing, that without intelligence you don't have consciousness, and therefore the rest of the living world is in some way less than we are. And I thought when I got to the uh, the wonderful material about the Baxter effect in your book, I thought of the Hopi prophecy and of those terrible moments that it that it d- depicts and the the way we need to turn the corner and maybe one of the things we need to do is to realize that consciousness is maybe part of the universe itself that we all everything taps into that intelligence just happens to be an organic effect that that we are involved with. Tell us a little bit about the Baxter effect and 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 what it all means. It's just marvelous. Well, well the Baxter effect was discovered by a man, uh, an expert uh, polygraph operator named Cleve Baxter. Well, the polygraph is what we call the, the, the lie detector. You wire it up to people and it measures. Uh, yes, biological. I've been wired up. Yeah, skin resistance, etc. And, uh, and and Baxter was really quite a world recognized expert back in the the sixties um, and seventies. He had helped the CIA back in the fifties when they first began uh, using the, the polygraph machine. And uh, he had a school where he taught early experts on how to use it. Uh, he was spending a late night in his office and uh, he noticed his house plant. And the thought popped into his head: What would happen? If I hook my house plant up to my polygraph machine, uh, he he thought, well, it's just a it's just a inanimate object. So he, I'll give it some water, and probably the conductivity change from the water will change the polygraph reading. What he found when he gave it water is that the plant responded not in the way he expected, but much more like a person would. There was an emotional response. You know, and these polygraph operators are trained to understand and interpret uh the output of their of their machine in very sophisticated ways. And so he was basically seeing changes in the surface resistance on the on the uh, uh, electro electrical changes in the surface of the plant that were similar to the changes that he sees when a person uh, has an emotional experience under the polygraph. Now, bear in mind, folks, we're not telling, saying necessarily that he was able to detect lies with his polygraph because that now is a very controversial issue. But we're saying that he was able to detect with his polygraph a similar state in a plant than we, than he was, that he was seeing in human beings. Now, on that thought, we're going to be right back because we've got to take a little break, and I think that you're going to find out something quite fascinating and quite empowering about the world around us. Just how can we make that turn, that shift in 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 paradigm that the Hopi are telling us we need to survive? We'll find out in just a minute. This is Whitley Strieber, and this is Dreamland. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back with Claude Swanson. His book, The Synchronized Universe, New Science of the Paranormal. If you're smart, you'll get it from the unknowncountry.com store, but get it anyway because it's full of the kind of empowering information that this radio program is all about. So it's why I'm out here. It's why I'm doing this. Because when you read these things, it goes into your heart and into your spirit, and you suddenly realize, hey, there's something real here, and it's something that can make me more conscious, a better and more important person in the largest sense, in the universal sense, if I acknowledge this and stop filtering it out, which, of course, our whole society is telling us to do every minute. You know, Forget the paranormal. Buy the new Acura. Well, we're running out of time, folks, uh, on that score. You better not forget what people like Claude Swanson have to tell you. Now, let's get back, besides, and please excuse my speechifying, uh, let's get back to Claude. We were talking about the Baxter effect. Let's go on. He had discovered that the, that plants, uh, were, were giving a similar pattern to the way human well, beings did. Uh, when, well, the next thing. Yeah, go ahead. Well, the next thing that happened, of course, completely blew his mind because polygraph operators are trained to put their subject under stress. And so when he noticed it was reacting in a pattern that looked like, you know, human emotion, the next thought he 
came to him was put under stress. So he said, well, what if I burn its leaf? To his shock, the moment that thought occurred to him, the plant's autograph output went crazy. It was showing a reaction. <laughs> you hear what the guy says, what Claude says here. <laughs> the moment he had he it. the thought, yeah. you know what we're living in here? What we're doing here in this incredibly sensitive living organism we call our world, it is aware of us. Can you imagine if the plant reacted that way, that one little plant, think of what happened in the world to all of the animals and all of the plants today. How can we do this? Wow. Go on, Claude. Keep telling us this is really something. Well, so... Of course, because he was very systematic in the way he went about this, and so now, 20 plus years later, this type of experiment has been reproduced hundreds of thousands of times in many countries around the world. But the the basic reaction he discovered is that plants do respond to us, to our emotions, and to our thoughts, even when we have done nothing, taken no physical steps to put them into action. And, and he, he did lots of experiments. He would, he would find that the plant could tell, for example, whether he really intended to cut or burn its leaf or whether he was simply trying to fool it. You know, it, it responded knowingly. And I have a son, uh, a, a teenager, who did reproduce this experiment for a science fair, and he found the same thing, that the moment he burned his finger, he was, it was an accident, 10 feet away from the plant, the plant went crazy and responded as though the plant felt his pain. <laughs> so, it, 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 so this this discovery um, has that that really it's, it's our what we find is that the cells in the plant and the cells in all living things apparently have this ability to communicate, and they communicate on the thought level, on the psychic level, uh, and this has led to a number of experiments that really verify that this phenomenon is real. Uh, one other example. Uh, is is our that that um, Cleve Baxter would allow visitors to his lab to take part in would be take take some cells from their mouth from the lining of their mouth and put it in a little test tube but he would put electrodes there and measure the output that person could then drive ten twenty a hundred miles away and go through various experiences and whenever that person had some strong emotional reaction the cells back in Baxter's lab at that moment showed a reaction. So apparently our cells are in communication, and the communication does not weaken with distance. So it's, it's a remarkable phenomenon. Let me ask you a big question. It is this, essentially. When your son was burned, the plant felt it. But when a forest burns down, millions of trees anything, we don't feel it or we don't recognize that we are feeling it. Which is it, Claude, and what can we do to resensitize ourselves? You talked about reintegration earlier. I think I'm talking about a, a, a very important aspect of reintegration, surrendering to the terrifying reality that there are sensitivities everywhere that are a part of consciousness. So how do you respond to that? Well, I think our, our education system, for one thing, teaches us to live in our left brain, in our logical, rational mind. Um, and we're taught, maybe by activities in school, but that was by sports, not to be, not to be a sissy, not to be emotional, not to show feelings. And there are lots of things in our society that kind of train us away from our sensitive awareness. Um, in the East, in ancient cultures, uh, in India and in China, uh, meditation was the key to quieting that chattering, talkative left brain. And when we quiet it, then we find that we're able then to access those intuitive feelings which, which do connect us with other living things. So I think um, meditation is uh, probably a very important uh, part of this whole process. And if, probably if everyone did it and if we if we understood how important it may be to our survival to our awareness of the pain we're causing other living things um, then 
this may be part of this full integration process, the hope that you're talking about. Okay, well, let's talk then about the physics of meditation because you've got some really interesting stuff there. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about where we are in understanding the physics of meditation? Um, well, we have we have lots of of data. One of the most interesting and illuminating experiments uh, has been done by hooking up, you know, the, uh, by wiring up the brain, measuring your EEG, your brain wave patterns. And then allowing that subject who's instrumented to be the recipient of ESP or psychic communication. And over many, many experiments, what we find is that when a psychic message is being sent to the individual, his brain changes its pattern in a way that indicates it did receive the signal. However, for most people, when you ask them after the session, were you aware there was a psychic message and or what was it? The people you know, said, no, I didn't receive anything. I wasn't aware of anything. And yet, at the subconscious level, their brain has just shown that they did receive something, but it never made it up to the conscious mind. So I think the, the key for most of us average folks who maybe don't feel very psychically gifted, the, the key is meditation and learning to quiet that chattering conscious mind so that then the thoughts and the signals from the subconscious can bubble up and we can become aware of it, and uh, that that tends to be the you know the sort of the universal um, observation that the more the more we practice it, uh, the better we get. I know that for example, remote viewers, uh, the military of course had a 20 year plus uh, uh, program developing remote viewers. Um, and now many of those graduates of that program have set up their own schools and teach it to others. Right. And uh, and, and and almost always, uh, one of the first things that they, they they tell you is to take a meditation course, learn to quiet the mind, and that's sort of the first step in becoming more psychic and so letting the psychic information bubble up. Okay, I really want to get into this. And in in your book, uh, you say this. Meditation is often considered to be a quieting of the mind because the talking part of the mind becomes quiet. The verbal and analytical processes cease. But brainwave studies show that actually the brain becomes more coherent in meditation. This means that the firings of the billions of neurons in the brain occur, occur more in step with one another. The electrical impulses from all the cells become less random, less independent. And then you say this state of mind has enormous power to affect reality. And Claude, what do you mean by that? Because I feel like if meditators really understood this, their meditation would become less the passive state we assume that it must be and more the active state that it actually is and can be. So tell us, tell us this. Um. In the first place, um, what we know is that uh, yogis or certain people who have practiced meditation for a very long time um, often develop a whole set of powers which defy modern science. And this seems to come from or certainly to accompany this very coherent brainwave state. Um, the powers might include not just um, ESP or remote viewing, but the ability to affect objects at a distance, psychokinesis, mind over matter. Um, the in many in many of the the great yogis, there are well documented cases where they appear in more than one place at a time. They bilocate, or they teleport, or other things that should be impossible. There are some yogis who have been observed by many hundreds or thousands of people to levitate, for example. Things that in our science should be impossible, but uh, there's a lot of evidence that it really does happen. So it seems to me that this very coherent state of mind uh, may be the key that allows them to affect external reality in ways that our present science doesn't expect or understand. Um, and then in the last chapter of my book, I do offer a so sort of the beginnings of a physical model that suggests how that could happen, that if we have a very coherent three-dimensional 
volume, so the brain, which is a very coherent state, uh, then it can affect other distant matter and cause patterns, coherent patterns, to become imposed upon that. And once you begin doing that, then you can start to sort of steer and cause forces to occur that we would not normally expect in our current physics, and yet they, you know, they do seem to happen. So it's just the beginnings of a model for what that very coherent state of mind can lead to. This is Whitley Strieber. In a, just a minute, we're going to get even deeper in even deeper with Claude into this because there's a chance for real empowerment here. I think you can see that. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back talking to Claude Swanson, the synchronized new universe, the new science of the paranormal. His website, www.synchronizeduniverse.com. Don't miss out on this because you can use this. The information in here is profoundly empowering. You can realize certain things. We were talking just a bit of, uh, earlier about meditation and about the fact that it's not a passive state that it's an active state. It's a state in which you can influence what happens in the world. Claude, what if somebody sets out to use meditation to hurt others, to use, as it were, black magic? What happens then? Well, there are some pretty strong rumors that that might have been one of the things that was going on in the military remote viewing program toward the end, but certain people have said that they, they were either doing it or were asked to do it, and it may have sort of led to some of the problems in the program. And I think it's kind of a natural temptation when um, when governments get involved in uh, these uh, phenomena that they, they look for ways of applying them for their own purposes. And uh, if there is no awareness of higher consciousness or of morality, uh, then that's where you can end up. And given our world today, every new discovery ends up becoming a weapon. So it's sort of natural. This is one of the the, 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 the drawbacks, if you like, one of the one of the uh, pitfalls of a new discovery. And this whole the whole era of the paranormal really includes a lot of new, very powerful discoveries. So I think one of the great questions is how do we develop it and how do we learn about it without misusing it? Uh, to me, to me, the key. The, the key is really sort of two, has two parts to it. One is to understand that one of the discoveries in the paranormal is that our consciousness does not require a physical body. Our consciousness can go out of body. We have lots of evidence for this. Our consciousness uh, survives death. We have near-death experiences, you know, by the tens of thousands. We, we know these things are true. Uh, we have lots of evidence for reincarnation. So that. Basically, the physical body that is sort of the Western idea of what life is about is a tiny fraction of what life is really about. And this whole consciousness has, a, has an existence that goes far beyond the physical. So, what happens when we do things, maybe to hurt our fellow man, in this lifetime? Well, if the soul keeps on going, then there are opportunities that that soul may have to pay back. And so there's a kind of a cosmic justice in that. The more you read, and it may, it may sound like an article of faith or religion, but the more I have studied this, the more convinced I am that karma is real, that there is a kind of a, a, a balance to what goes around comes around, because we're all here for a long time. We're all here to learn, I believe, and I think the evidence supports that. So hopefully uh, anyone who is looking at the paranormal as a new technology which they can exploit to hurt others, they will, in the process of learning about it, also understand that they too have souls, that we're all here for the long term, and that things that we do that misuse our powers, that the universe has ways that these, that a balance and a reckoning will occur over time. So hopefully as we become wiser about the larger dimensions of this whole subject, will become wiser in how we use these new discoveries. We will hopefully become wiser. I know much too much about what happened in the remote viewing program toward the in its end uh, end times in its last days. And you're quite right. Some people were hurt, and it, it was ugly, ugly, ugly. I'm glad it's 
it's not part of my life anymore. I can tell you that right now. Now, you call the book The Synchronized Universe for a very specific reason. Why don't you explain this? Uh, it's fascinating. Go, explain what, it, what is a synchronized universe as opposed to what we thought was there or many mainstream scientists still think is there. Sure. Uh, and, and first of all, I want to make to point out that synchronized is with a Z. We Americans spell it with a Z, and so that's how I'm spelling it. Uh, the English spell it with an S. So if one is doing a Google search, make sure you spell synchronized with a Z. <laughs> uh, and the, 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 the term really comes from a physics model, because I'm a physicist, and I'm really deeply interested in getting physics to begin to try to account for these phenomena and try to broaden our current science so that it can encompass the paranormal. So we don't keep having, you know, this this big rift between the scientists and those who were aware of paranormal phenomena. Uh, to me, science, its obligation is to study it and to understand it. Um, the model that I came up with involves looking at elementary particles, the smallest particles that make up matter, like electrons and protons, looking at them at very small scales. And uh, when you do, you realize there's a very good reason to believe that they're traveling moment to moment over very short distances, very short times, at very high velocities. They don't go anywhere. But if you could see them under a microscope, they would appear to be zipping around at almost the speed of light back and forth in a very small volume. And this is sort of according to the current theory. Um, when this happens, it, it causes them to interact with other particles in the universe uh, over very large distances. There's a whole way that that could occur. And um, what the model leads to is the idea that over very small scales, which are called the, it's called the Planck length, it's kind of the smallest scale that our physics believes makes any sense, that on those scales, these particles would become synchronized. Their motions, they would, they would start undergoing little orbits, basically, around their central average location. And their little orbits would be synchronized with each other, even across the entire width of the universe, so that all the particles that we call our universe, our reality, may actually be synchronized um, in their motions at that scale. And this is necessary for them to interact with each other. There could be other particles which are not synchronized with them. They would be invisible to us. And so you end up with a, a series of universes parallel universes, which could exist at the same time in the same space, each synchronized among itself, but not able to see or interact with the other ones. And um, could there be a, could, to, yeah. Claude, could there be a technology, perhaps, that would enable someone to synchronize, to move their own synchronization from one universe to another? Absolutely. That is one of the predictions of the model. Uh, this explains how you could walk through walls, for example, which there's, you know, as you as you well know, there's some evidence that this happens or has happened. And, uh, yeah, and how, because how I've, I have lived this myself. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, so, I've gone through walls with, with people who could do that, I, you know, exactly. not, not alone ever. Uh, right. I, I'm I too horrified about the idea of getting stuck in one to even try. <laughs> Exactly, but and, and I'm well aware of that, and so and so this technology would allow and explain how that can happen, how how you can walk through walls, and a variety of other things which we know do occur in the paranormal. This this kind of it, it, teleportation, for one, is a very natural prediction of this model. So it's it kind of it's, it's a model which is a offers a bigger stage than our current science. And that bigger stage that allows us to understand a whole range of paranormal phenomena. Could we conceivably move between worlds like that to cross the membrane between worlds without technology just by something we do with our minds? In other words, could we learn to do this? I, I believe so. I believe that there are, you know, advanced people who have done that and, and do that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I agree with you, and I agree with you for a very simple reason. I have done it myself, and not, not intentionally. I wish I could, but mm -hmm. uh, I have not only have I moved through space into a different realm, uh, I've also done that through time. 
and mm-hmm. vividly. In, in, and uh, these are incidents I've written about in my books. Uh, the one through space was very simple. I was taking a little boy to meet his father uh, to exchange children. We, our, our kids, we used to have country houses about 100 miles apart, and we would exchange kids in the middle. I was taking him to give to meet his father at our the diner and on Route 17 in New Jersey where we exchanged our kids. I turned off of Route 17 in a very crowded part of New Jersey, right beside the Paramus Mall, and suddenly the mall was gone, everything was gone, and we were in a different world entirely. And uh, the little boy saw it too. It was no secret. Boy, I had trouble keeping him in the car. He was so frightened he started trying to jump out of the car because we were suddenly driving down a wide, shady street with these strange, rather sinister-looking buildings set up against, uh, in, 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 um, amid, amid trees uh, that had uh, looked like they were made of sandstone and had sort of serpents carved in them. It was not of this world at all. It was quite obviously not. And uh, when we get back, we're going to stop here for a couple of seconds for a couple of commercials. And please do listen and do respond. It'll probably be me talking and begging you to subscribe to UnknownCountry.com. And, you know, you can keep this thing going by doing this, just that. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is Whitley Strieber. It's Dreamland. We're back with Claude Swanson to conclude that story very briefly. After driving around helplessly and terrified in this strange other world for a few minutes and thinking, God, my God, I'm, I'm, I've got this other guy's kid here and I don't know if we're ever going to get back. I don't know where we are. Suddenly we found ourselves on, in a, in a, in a, in a, on a little side road leading up to a familiar highway about 20 miles away. And I got him back to the diner. By the time I got him back, his father, who had seen us turn off toward the Paramus Mall to cross over Route 17 and return to the diner, was standing in the bed of his truck looking for us because we'd been gone so long. And he couldn't understand, you know, since he'd seen us just turn, we should have been back at the diner in two minutes. And instead, it was 25 minutes. He was very concerned. Then the little boy, whom I had hoped had sort of glossed this over because his father was a very skeptical guy and he didn't li- like the old alien stuff and so forth that I wrote about, uh, jumps out of the car and goes running over to his dad and says, Daddy, Daddy, Whitley took me on a ride through the Twilight Zone. Uh, Claude, where were we? Where in heck were we? <laughs> well, I, I'm familiar with your story, and I read it in your book, and it's, it's a wonderful example of this type of phenomenon. Um, I think the, the model that I'm setting up in the synchronized universe, especially in the last... Uh, chapter uh, does explain how these parallel realities uh, can exist. Uh, if you read the Billy Meyer contact uh, uh, notes, where his, he's encountered with the Pleiadians, and there are many, many things. And of course, you know, one of the difficulties, of course, in all of these materials is to to figure out which ones you believe, which ones you don't, which ones are credible, which ones are not. But I think there are lots of examples like that where uh, where parallel realities do get come in contact with each other, uh, not just uh, necessarily uh, simultaneous parallel realities, but sometimes our present reality at a different time. People shift in time. Well, that that uh, happened. I've had that experience, too, and I know, it, I know it's possible. And what's so, what's so, in a way, so exciting about your book that I've always believed that this is something that basically we have to do together. I've been, in many ways, quite blessed and lucky that I've had this phenomena appear in my life and it has empowered me but i think that it un, until more of us are turned on to this and begin to realize that it's possible we're going to stay the way we are i believe in another world maybe in a future world where our minds have been open to these possibilities we'll be able to turn these corners ordinarily and we'll live <laughs> in a much bigger universe in space and in time that's right here, right now, and we're here in this little corner suffocating, and we got to get out of here. I think you're talking about the way out, my friend, and I think that makes you quite a hero. So uh, how, do you, how do you react to that? And, 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 and do you think maybe we could turn the corner before it's too late? Could it happen soon enough to defeat the Hopi prophecy? Well, well, thank you very much, first of all, Whitley. Um, you know, I, I sort of viewed my role in this um, as speaking up for all those folks who are kind of right-brain challenged 
uh, I have many, many friends who have extraordinary experiences like, like you have and who have known, you know, in their, in their soul for a long time that these phenomena are real. Um, I kind of got into this whole subject from the left brain by, by studying the science of it and studying the evidence and, and, and talking to people who had these experiences, um, like an interviewer, you know, or a chronicler and trying to figure out where the truth was. So I've, it's been a very left brain process for me, and so I'm really trying to write to, to write the book if, if, as much as much for those left brain people who, if you have an open mind but you have no experiences, at least kind of say, okay, here's the evidence. You know, here's here's the part that our science has to catch up. So our science will stop telling all these people that it couldn't have happened. You know, and so to me that kind of that that answers the other side of the problem, which is to get the the left brain in sync with the right brain so that we don't have this resistance anymore to the reality of these phenomena. We can say, okay, uh, we're starting to understand the science. Uh, we know these phenomena are real. We're learning how to deal with them. Um, and uh, I mean, to, I mean, to me, it's a process of trying to get us, our entire society um, more comfortable with this larger universe that we're finding you know, really exists. Now, folks, one of the things you all write me a lot about is prophecy. Every time I have a someone like John Hogue or uh, Ray Grass on the radio program uh, and we talk prophecy, there's a big response. Let me tell you something. You are a prophet. Listening to this right now, you, your family, your children, everyone is a prophet. And I think Claude can prove that to you by talking just about the World Trade Center catastrophe and what happened right before it. Claude, you're familiar with, I'm sure, you know, I'm one of these horrible interviewers who reads every book in great detail, and I can catch people short, but you do remember this part of your book, of course. Yes, I, I do. Oh, great, because uh, I'm, I'm what, delighted. Tell what us I about what, it. Yeah, what I think what he's referring to here is uh, one, of the, one of the great uh, technologies, the great inventions, which uh, parapsychologists and people who study the paranormal have discovered is called the random event generator. It's basically uh, it's like a little noise maker that makes that spews out ones and zeros in kind of a random fashion. And you can hook one up to your co- your computer and you can measure it. And on the average, it ought to behave totally randomly. Uh, what we have found is that these devices uh, do respond to the human mind, to human intention, and they use them for measuring psychokinesis and ESP. Uh, It turns out that people are able to affect these things. Uh, At the current time, there's a project called the Global Consciousness Project. It's run jointly by Noetic Sciences and the Princeton University Paralab, and they have a hundred or more of these devices around the world. What we find is that when there are powerful global events that uh, focus people's consciousness onto that event that these random event generators, which are basically measuring quantum noise, do not act randomly anymore. They start to act like they're coupled together. And it's very, very strange. It's very dramatic. Uh, and so for the World Trade Center uh, disaster, 9-11, several hours before the first plane crashed into the building, this global network of devices was starting to show an anomaly. They were starting already to show that something unusual was going on. And uh, if you follow the data right up to the moment it happened and the next hours after it happened, the statistics on the output of these devices just goes off the, uh, you know, goes through the roof, basically. They were showing an anomaly of a, of a huge magnitude. So, so we have our first... Um, it's a detector of the human global consciousness, if you like. It kind of shows... Here's an interesting yeah, go ahead. thing. Uh, that was not true before the tsunami just recently, I have discovered. And I think I know the reason. The reason is that the World Trade Center was a catastrophe that was being generated in the human mind by human beings in human consciousness. And an awful lot of us were feeling it before while they were in other words we were empathizing with those terrorists and with the t- frightened sick with fear people on the airplanes and 
but before the tsunami, of course, no human being knew it was about to come. And, uh, uh, so it didn't, there was not that, uh, not that, that type of surge. Very interesting, I think. Now, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I, I'm not, yeah, I, it's a, that is interesting. I have not looked into the tsunami results. So, so you're saying there's very little, very little effect there. Well, well, there's, there's some, but it's nothing like the World Trade Center. Yeah, I think I think it's I mean, the phenomenon. Of course, the disaster was spread out over thousands of miles, different cultures, different countries, which might make it more diffuse, less of a single event to focus on. To uh, that 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 burning tower that we woke up to see on television that morning, you know, was a pretty dramatic single point focus. To... Yeah, indeed it was. Indeed it was. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, we're getting up toward the the end of the program. We've only got a couple of minutes left. And we've covered uh, some really just a few highlights from this marvelous text. And uh, uh, what is there? There must be things that you'd like to talk about that I haven't brought up because, gosh, in here there are hundreds and hundreds of different directions to go in. I could ask you questions for the next two days, and we'd only have covered about a third of the book. So you, t- you tell me ne- next where you want to go. Well, I think, I mean, to me, the one of the most exciting uh, pieces here really is that our science is undergoing a revolution. If this is as far-reaching or more far-reaching than the discovery of quantum mechanics and relativity 100 years ago, uh, it's we don't know where it's going to go in terms of our science, but there are we're finding that our science is breaking down in many, many areas, and you're not getting a lot of publicity. Uh, cold fusion is one example, uh, various types of free energy inventions. I mean, you can go, uh, there, there are problems with our gravity theory. There are all kinds of areas where our current science is kind of reaching a sticking point where we're finding out that there are limitations to the present edifice and needs to be rebuilt from the ground up. Uh, so that's pretty exciting because there'll be inventions, and there'll be whole, whole new worldviews that will come out of that. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do, I've set up a little organization in Colorado Springs called the Synchronized Energy Institute, and uh, I'm trying to pursue a couple of the areas that, to me, are most important. One is, um, well, of course, there, there are four more books that I'm working on. Uh, I mentioned that in this book. I have Only other... four? <laughs> well, initially it was all going to be one book, but the book would have been huge, and so I had to had to break it up, but the, the volume two that I'm working on now is going to be on subtle energy and healing, and uh, volume three will be on the soul, uh, but those will be, you know, several months away, they're not, not ready yet, um, but I'm also trying to pursue, you know, the mathematics, basically, to, to sort of put the, the physical model into a mathematical form, and that's what the Institute in Colorado Springs I'm, I'm setting up is just trying to focus on, is trying to get this stuff into a more rigorous form where science cannot continue to ignore it. And the other part is, as I mentioned in, in, in my book, uh, there have been experiments that show that I would call it the human soul, but you could call it the astral body or other terminology, that it's a, it, it, is, it is real. I mean, there, many people think, well, I have an out-of-body experience, but maybe it's just all in my mind and my imagination. Uh, there have been experiments where um, a person will be re- remote viewing a distant uh, target, and around that target are various electronic measuring devices, and they find that there is an energy that is measured near the target when the person is giving accurate information. So it appears that we have the beginnings of a way of actually measuring what the astral body is. And, you know, we don't have the instruments yet to really fully understand it, but at least we have enough to show that there is something there. There's an energy form that defies current science, and it's probably the energy of consciousness or the energy of the soul. So we're getting into really, uh, you know, deep implications here that I think will just carry our science to a whole new level as we begin to explore this. Claude Swanson, a remarkable achievement, the synchronized universe, the new science of the paranormal, his website, synchronizeduniverse.com. 
Thank you, Claude. It has been a very enlightening and, I hope, folks, empowering experience because we ain't got a lot of time before we get to the next point in that Hopi prophecy, which is quite real. It comes from a level of consciousness that we've lost touch with. You have to get us back in touch. You personally, ladies and gentlemen, kids, you got to do it. This is Whitley Strieber. Next up, Linda Moulton Howe. One reporter who loves mysteries is radio's leading science journalist, Linda Moulton Howe. She's an Emmy Award winning TV producer, documentary filmmaker, and writer, and the reporter and editor for EarthFiles.com, the Internet's most respected and most exciting edge science website. Today, she's got a special report for us on microbes in the caves of Earth and the caves of Mars. Here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks, Whitley. Yeah, put a question mark on that issue of Mars. Last week at the first European Space Agency Mars Express Orbiter Conference in the Netherlands, the Italian physicist Vittorio Formazano presented data about the presence of not only methane and water vapor in the Martian atmosphere, but formaldehyde. Small amounts of formaldehyde had also been reported previously by NASA, but attributed to the oxidation and breakdown of methane in the Martian atmosphere. But Dr. Formazano, who is the creator and principal investigator of the planetary Fourier spectrometer on the European Space Agency's Mars orbiter, reported at the meeting that his data is showing about 10 to 20 times more formaldehyde than methane. If his data proves to be accurate over time and other measurements are supporting it, the amount of methane will also have to be revised upward, since most methane is oxidized as soon as it comes out of the ground. Dr. Formazano told the ESA meeting of scientists, quote, if you consider formaldehyde as oxidized methane, then Mars is producing 2.5 million tons of methane a year, unquote. One area on Mars where his PSF instrument found the greatest concentration of methane was over the Elysium Planitia near the Martian equator. That is the same region that British scientist John Murray reported a large frozen sea equivalent in size to Lake Michigan. Dr. Formazano said that the amount of methane his PSF instrument has measured is too large to be accounted for by any known geological process. Thus, he hypothesized that some other source must be involved. In fact, Dr. Formazano said publicly, quote, I do believe there is life inside the planet Earth, maybe 50 to 100 meters below the surface. But there is a long way to go to demonstrate that, unquote. Since there is no instrument on Mars to measure the isotopic ratio of the methane, which could distinguish between an organic or inorganic source, scientists are now looking for heavier hydrocarbons in the Martian atmosphere, such as propane, which cannot come from geothermal, geothermal inorganic processes, like from a volcano, even though there's no evidence of active volcanoes on Mars either that still is being proposed as a possible source for these gases. Meanwhile, back on Earth, in the caves of New Mexico and the nation of Mexico, renowned microbiologist and atmospheric chemist Penelope Boston is studying and cataloging a huge array of creatures that literally eat their way through cave rock and leave telltale residues of their exotic but organic existences. She wants to assemble a kind of field guide to cave and subterranean microbes, which can be used on future field trips to Mars. I first talked with her during the ESA meeting in the Netherlands when Dr. Murray's pack ice discovery in the Elysium Planitia was first reported, and Dr. Formazano said that was where he found the greatest concentration of methane. Well, see, that's extremely exciting. I mean, one of the things that we've been wondering about was how 
uh, w what are the present instruments that are on board the different spacecraft that are currently in orbital configuration, whether any of them uh, could narrow down the, um, the methane detection to the point where there might be point sources or at least localized sources rather than an overall background methane um, signal. Finding a, a solid uh, indication that there is more localized sources of methane supports both the potential life uh, hypothesis and, and also the leaky hydrothermal, you know, from a volcanic source hypothesis. It doesn't distinguish between those, but it makes those more likely in this um, generalized area. Formaldehyde uh, and other gases in the sure. ocean atmosphere. Sure, but so can also non-biological processes. And so what one has to now do with these tantalizing results is try to figure out ways to test them further to try to distinguish between, you know, volcanic residual activity and critters. Well, isn't it true that formaldehyde under the uh, stress of UV uh, hitting Mars could only survive as a molecule in the atmosphere only about seven hours? Yeah, I think it's a very short half-life. It's um, The, ha the half-life is probably ten hours or it's certainly like on the order of a day. And that would mean yeah. that if there is enough sustaining formaldehyde to be measured by the PSF, then uh, the implication, the hypothesis is that something has to be generating formaldehyde yeah. on a daily basis. The same can also be said for ammonia and, and, and indeed methane, although the methane half-life is more on the order of 100 years. But nevertheless, it's still sufficiently short that you know, detection of it, positive detection of it, is quite uh, significant. How would your work looking at caves and uh, subterranean underground uh, life on Earth uh, give us some insight about what might be living on Earth emitting methane and formaldehyde and other gases? Well, you know, all of these gases are common, uh, common products of the kinds of systems that we're studying. Most of the things that interest us are organisms that are taking inorganic materials and typically oxidizing them and getting a small amount of energy to run their life processes from that reaction. And very often they excel in transforming the state of different materials. So, for example, we have organisms that transform hydrogen sulfide into sulfates and vice versa. Um, same can be said, of course, with methane. There are organisms that produce methane from CO2 um, using inorganic sources of energy like oxidizing metals and things like that. Um, and then there are organisms that eat it. So uh, just about every chemical transformation that you can think of uh, is probably done by at least one or more different kinds of microorganisms. Hmm. They are the master chemists of the planet. The rest of us big organisms um, really inherit the um, spectrum of materials that these guys produce, you know, and they're, and they're very involved in global biogeochemical cycling. And so one can imagine a subsurface system like the ones that we study, whether or not the actual organisms even resemble Earth organisms, I don't think is really the point. The point is how biological systems make their living and what the side effects of that are, what are the things that they emit. And I think that you can look at the kinds of systems that we and other groups are studying and infer a good deal about how any kind of biological system in that environment would by force be um, forced to make its living by extracting chemical energy from its environment. And so even if the organisms looked really different, and even if they had very different biochemistry, I could imagine that the metabolism type that they would use and the way they would get energy would be imposed on them by the environment rather than um, um, by the details of their own biochemistry. So um, I think that the, the work that we're doing trying to look at both you know, trace gas emissions from organisms, the way they may change the um, actual rock surfaces and the minerals that get precipitated, all of these things add up to um, a suite of biosignatures that one could then take to the Mars uh, case and match them up against what you could find. And some of that can be done from orbit, for example, gas detection, but a lot of the other things that we are interested in, in looking for can only be done by landed missions and hopefully someday by, uh, by human scientists. Can you give examples of what you're studying on Earth? Yes, we're studying a, a wide variety of different subsurface systems. Uh, 
Lecce Gia Cave and uh, Carlsbad Caverns and a number of the other smaller caves in the Carlsbad area in New Mexico are caves that date from perhaps 5 to maybe 12 million years old. These are quite ancient caves. And um, in there we find a number of microorganisms that make their living oxidizing manganese compounds and iron compounds. And as a result of that, they're basically chewing their way through the bedrock in these caves and degrading the bedrock and then leaving these characteristic minerals behind. And they're doing it today, and they're doing it at a very slow rate. So we're interested in that because this material that they leave behind is pretty characteristic. And so, for example, even if all the microorganisms were gone, based on what we now know about what they do, we could look at material that has some of these minerals and these special crystal forms in them and say, aha, we believe this is probably the product of microorganisms. Mm -hmm. But that's one set of stuff that we're looking at. And what do, what do, just a minute. What do those microorganisms release in terms of gases as they chew through the Carlsbad cave system? Well, release CO2, uh, amongst other things. None of these guys are methane releasers. Um, but there are systems that um, that are anaerobic where oxygen doesn't enter into the system, and in those cases, um, there are methane-generating organisms. Uh, what about formaldehyde? Um, we haven't looked for that. We haven't looked for that, so I don't know. Mm. So what uh, Formaldehyde is not an uncommon byproduct of microbial breakdown of organic material. So, for example, we have uh, several different aldehydes, some that we haven't identified in the sulfuric acid caves that we're studying in Mexico. So we're looking there at organisms that are making their living by metabolizing sulfur in one form or another. And we know that there are background levels of a uh, number of different aldehydes um, that are unusual. And in fact, that's a, an active area of, of research. About. So the sulfur eaters are releasing uh, gases such as formaldehyde? Well, something in the system is. We don't know if it's the critters themselves or some other microbe that's breaking down organic material that these sulfur organisms are responsible for initially creating or what. So we don't know the precise source of it, but we do know that the levels are higher. One of the things that, that I have to emphasize is that the uh, microbial subsurface communities are by and large novel, meaning that we don't have them already in the DNA databases, and this is because they've not been studied. So. When you look at one of these areas, a lot of the organisms are so different that they could even be put in different domains. And the part of our team that was working on molecular biology, um, Diana Northup and her colleagues at UNM, um, are looking at um, these organisms and putting them near their closest relatives, but many of them don't have very many close relatives or any um, amongst the known bacteria. So. Um, so I can tell you the names of a few that we find because they happen to be ones that have been identified before or are close to them. Mm -hmm. But by and large, these are um, really terra incognita. <laughs> so some of the organisms that we find in these um, snotites, as they're called, in the Mexican cave, because they look like strings of snot, basically. Huh. Um, they produce all this gooey material, and they look like stalactites because they hang down. And the snotites are, are in Mexico only in the sulfuric acid case? Yes, absolutely. They are sulfuric acid beasts. They are fed by the hydrogen sulfide. They produce sulfuric acid. They produce this copious amounts of snot. And, I mean, it looks like snot, and, and in fact, chemically, it's very similar to uh, slimy stuff that would come out of uh, a person's nose with a cold. I mean, it really is mm -hmm. extracellular polysaccharide goo, and, and chemically, it's very similar. And the organisms use it as a protection, you know, as part of their their natural protection against their environment and their way of chemically controlling their immediate environment. And they actually produce uh, sulfuric acid as a byproduct of their metabolism. So these guys are in there busy producing acid, and then there's the abiological production of sulfuric acid just from the hydrogen sulfide going into solution in the water and, cr and reacting with the oxygen. So these caves drip with sulfuric acid, and uh, they're very difficult for us to work in, as you can imagine, and the, the atmosphere is poisonous, but they're absolutely bursting with life. They're just absolutely biologically intensely rich. And there's just so many organisms in there that I just can't even regale you <laughs> okay. the numbers. You know, there's just everywhere you look in these caves, there's new microbial goo or new a new different kind of microbial man 
Many of them are busily precipitating minerals, unique minerals, um, while they grow in the goo in which they're growing. So, And these are the ones that would release formaldehydes and other aldehyde gases? Well, something in the system is. I don't think it's those organisms per se. Um, I think we don't know which of the many possible um, actors in the play are producing that material. And could these... Um, microorganisms that you're studying in Mexico that love sulfuric acid and uh, you're in caves that are alive with life um, and that their DNA is uh, really not known uh, in any other categories on the earth, could these same organisms be at work in caves and subterranean systems on Mars? Well, something like them, I think, could very well be the case. Um, you know, we don't know whether or not, if we find life on Mars right now, we don't know how to speculate whether or not it would be related to us here. Um, that is, was there a single genesis of life and because of material being blasted, you know, out of Mars and carried here or and vice versa, you know, there's a shuttle mechanism for potentially getting organisms from one place to the next. So we wouldn't know that until we looked at the details of those organisms. But in terms of the way the organisms here make their living in these environments, I think that it's a very good model for the way potential Martian subsurface microbes might be making their living. And releasing gases yes. into the atmosphere. releasing gases as a byproduct of that metabolism. Now, what about temperatures? Um, is there evidence that there is enough heat in the interior of Mars that subterranean organisms such as what you're studying in Mexico could live there? Um, I think that all you need is the ability to have liquid water, and that can be, of course, at very low temperatures, below what we normally consider freezing, if the solution is briny. So, well, I'm a at quite chilly temperatures where the water could remain liquid and organisms could have uh, evolved to tolerate that and prosper in that, that uh, circumstance. So that extends down the possible temperature at which um, the organisms could live. Based on the work that you've done in Mexico and New Mexico so far in caves, what is your best educated guess about what could be underground on Mars? Um, I would guess that if it resembles Earth at all, that um, pretty much most of the subsurface where there was the availability of liquid water um, might be inhabited by very uh, low biomass, that is a low number of organisms, but nevertheless organisms making their living very similarly to here. A chewing away on... Chewing uh, away, yes. The liberating materials out of the rock that they can use, um, dissolving the rock in order to get to those materials, and um, leaving characteristic telltale byproducts uh, in the way of minerals, very characteristic minerals. And that uh, you can look for, in the sulfur range, uh, you can look for crystals that could be the product of these microorganisms, chewing them up and excreting them. Yes, as a matter of fact, exactly right. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we see um, in caves is basically bug poop. You know, it doesn't <laughs> seem like animal poop, but and it, and very often it's quite beautiful. If you look at SEMs of some of these crystals, uh, you know, they're very beautiful minerals. But nevertheless, in the biological functional sense of the term, this is really bug poop. And so you're looking for, you know, scat, basically, <laughs> microbial scat. And but an overlapping map that would show where there's high methane and formaldehyde plus high, perhaps, uh, ice pack on the surface yes. um, could be the focus for a world or could be subterranean life. Oh, yeah, definitely putting together what data has been gathered by the different missions on um, the subsurface ice detection and or water detection and also um, anywhere that any kind of reduced gas, whether it's formaldehyde or methane or ammonia or anything else, um, could be localized. Those would be places that, of course, you'd want to go. Lava tubes on Earth are places that Dr. Boston knows from research experience are filled with living microbes, and lava tubes on Mars are the first place she would like to look for life. One of the Martian lava tubes she has been studying from Mars Orbiter Images is in Olympus Mons, 
and you can see very clear, high-resolution images of the Olympus Mons lava tube system at my website, www.earthfiles.com. At the top of the headlines page, there is a hot link to this report about cave and subterranean creatures. The Olympus Mons lava tube has both sunken in sections and covered sections, and it's those covered or roof channels which Dr. Boston thinks would provide the most protection for living organisms. And this would be a place you would really want to get. I would, I would love to go there. I would be packing tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> any chance. I would too, actually. I'd be packing, packing my little robots. <laughs> get, um, you know, one of the things that we've been working on for the last number of years with some money from the NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts is um, a joint project that we're doing with uh, uh, the Field and Space Robotics Group at MIT. And we've come up with these little cute, tiny, bouncing, um, sort of tennis ball-sized micro-robot <laughs> concept. We haven't built any of these yet. There isn't enough money in the small pilot project we've been doing. But we've developed these as a as a concept. And they use um, um, some of these artificial muscles, you know, these artificial muscle materials to propel themselves. <laughs> and they kind of blink their way into a cave and you deploy lots of them. And the idea is that you can make lots of them relatively inexpensively and send them to Mars. Um, one of our calculations has shown that we could send probably a thousand of these little guys um, within a spacecraft the size that delivered the Mer rovers. Hmm. And so these guys, you could you could span the high mortality of them in these these challenging environments, and yet still have enough to do the job. And they would be able to um, communicate with one another, essentially like a cell network does. So node-to-node -node communication and make their way into some of these kinds of challenging rough terrains that things like the big Mer rovers have no hope of getting into. They do a lot of valuable science. Um, it's a very different strategy for robotic um, exploration uh, of these kind of rugged terrains. Yes, I've never heard of this before, and I'm trying to get in my mind's eye that inside of the spacecraft there would yeah. be all like a thousand balls, so to speak. Yeah, that a thousand little guys that would then deploy from the um, you know the, the mothership, so to speak, the, the master robot when it landed. Um, right, and if one could land that near, relatively near, some interesting terrain, and the variety of photographs that Dr. Boston has shared with me about both organisms inside of caves and lava tubes and subterranean chambers that she studied on Earth, some identified, but so many unidentified. She has photographs of what are classified as unknown organisms, and they are on our own planet. How interesting it would be if we can get to Mars with her field guide that she literally is developing to help in field research on Mars and that any of these hundreds and hundreds of different creatures uh, with their very uh, remarkable and characteristic residues that are left behind even when they have moved on in their rock eating could be found on Mars, what a step it would be. Linda, thank you very much for a terrific report. Next week on Dreamland, Stephen Sora is back, one of our most popular all-time guests, the lost colony of the Templars, Verrazano's secret mission to America. This is truly an amazing breakthrough on Stephen Sora's part. He's been researching it for a long time. And then Stephen Sora's going to be on Mysterious Powers with Ann Streber as well with another book. He's publishing two books at the same time Treasures from Heaven Relics from Noah's Ark to the Shroud of Turin all the latest information about these strange objects from our lost past in their meaning it's Stephen Sora Week on UnknownCountry.com teachings and trainings you know, in, in the past uh, societies that were aware of how important it is to, to have access to wisdom and meditation and prayer before making decisions, but our current Western society seems to be sort of based on a materialistic view of the universe, and uh, so that, I suspect this may be exactly the dilemma that uh, we're at right now. It's also based on a tremendously, a, a very, very iffy 
tremendously dangerous assumption, and it is that consciousness and intelligence are essentially the same thing, that without intelligence you don't have consciousness, and therefore the rest of the living world is in some way less than we are. And I thought when I got to the uh, the wonderful material about the Baxter effect in your book, I thought of the Hopi prophecy and of those terrible moments that it that it d- depicts and the the way we need to turn the corner and maybe one of the things we need to do is to realize that consciousness is maybe part of the universe itself that we all everything taps into that intelligence just happens to be an organic effect that that we are involved with. Tell us a little bit about the Baxter effect and and, and what it all means. It's just marvelous. Well, well, the Baxter effect was discovered by a man, uh, an expert uh, polygraph operator named Cleve Baxter. The polygraph is what we call the the, the lie detector. You wire it up to people and it measures. uh, Yes, I've been wired up. Yeah, skin resistance, etc. And uh, and and Baxter was really quite a world recognized expert back in the the, the um, 60s and 70s. He had helped the CIA back in the 50s when they first began uh, using the, the polygraph machine. And uh, he had a school where he taught early experts on how to use it. Uh, he was spending a late night in his office and uh, he noticed his house plant. And the thought popped into his head: What would happen? If I hook my house plant up to my polygraph machine, uh, he, he well, discussion about a Hopi prophecy, and it's really also a discussion about something that we have lost that they perhaps still have access to. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that philosophy and especially where it is, which is a remarkable story. Well, the Hopis have an ancient prophecy, and it is inscribed um, in the Southwest on uh, petroglyphs, you know, writings on stone. And the the basic interpretation of the meaning of these petroglyphs is it shows a timeline, and it shows uh, humans uh, progressing through time, and there are various markers and various predicted events along this timeline. And uh, the most recent markers uh, involved World War One, World War Two, and something that looks like the present day. And the human beings are depicted with their bodies and their heads separated from each other, which is interpreted by the Hopis as meaning that our physical awareness and our spiritual awareness are not in communication with each other. We're not really... You know, we're, we're not in contact with our spiritual higher guidance when we make decisions about the physical world. And what the Hopi prophecy indicates is that unless we very quickly uh, reintegrate, bridge this gap between the spiritual and the physical, uh, we're headed toward another period of great destruction. And if you look at the technological weapons we have, in our present arsenal, which have been created by our physical science, um, you know, not to mention atomic weapons, but the biological weapons and all sorts of other things that we've created, um, those are things that come out of our physical science. But unless we use a higher spiritual wisdom in how these things are dealt with and how we deal with each other on the planet, uh, this may be exactly, you know, the dilemma that we're in right now, and we really need to. Uh, be to, to, to learn again to get access to this higher wisdom, and uh, there have been, uh, you know, t- happening right now is that science is changing course in a big, big way. We have people like uh, Dr. Hal Putoff publishing an amazing paper in the Journey of the British Interplanetary Society, in the journal, rather, of the British Interplanetary Society, a highly prestigious scientific journal, saying that aliens are not only real but probably here, and that is becoming an accepted idea in science. A lot of other things are com- becoming accepted, too. And now a prominent physicist, Dr. Claude Swanson, who was educated at MIT in Princeton, is asking some very serious questions about the paranormal. 
it seems that there is a scientific revolution taking place, and I'm very pleased to, to welcome Claude Swanson to this radio program. His new book, The Synchronized Universe, a quite amazing compendium of just what science does already know and is no longer ignoring about the paranormal. Welcome, Claude. Thank you, Whitley. Glad to be here. Well, it's really a pleasure to have you and to have this exciting book with you, with us as well. Uh, Claude, it, it is huge. And incidentally, folks, his website is www.synchronizeduniverse.com. And Claude, let me, you have obviously spent a great deal of time and effort on this. There are so many remarkable cases and remarkable studies referenced in here. I had no idea how much scientific proof there already was. Uh, well, like, for example, let's talk about ESP a little bit, just to start off. Exactly. Um, I, I think as a sort of conventionally mainstream educated scientist, um, it was really a shock to me when I first began delving into the paranormal. Uh, and it really kind of came out of a quest for wanting to understand the universe at a deep level and I, I loved unified field theory, and I really wanted to, you know, to have a theory that was really satisfying, that it pulled things together. And in the mid-'80s, um, when I discovered, um, I, I think it probably is connected. Um, as as you know, and, and as I sort of make clear in the book, uh, our present science does not have a theory for any of these paranormal phenomena. And by and large, most scientists don't even consider there is a problem because they don't know about the evidence, um, but I, I agree with you that probably a quantum phenomena, quantum entanglement may be one of the phenomena at the heart of an eventual explanation. The, the tricky thing is that quantum entanglement is part of our conventional physics, so if we could explain all of the paranormal by quantum effects, uh, that would make physicists pretty happy because that would mean the conventional physics really has the machinery already to explain the paranormal. The difficulty is that there are paranormal effects that seem to break and defy uh, even quantum mechanics. Uh, for example, one of, the, uh, one of the central foundations of quantum mechanics is the idea of the uncertainty principle, which says that there's a certain level of quantum noise that's present everywhere, and that's of a fundamental number of the universe. But we find that when many people focus on the same thought, this is, these are, there have been uh, various uh, synchronized prayer uh, vigils around the world. Dr. James Twyman, among others, has led some of these. Uh, there have been uh, group consciousness experiments, such as the O.J. Simpson trial, when you have millions of people focusing on a single event being shown on television. And when, the, when many, many minds are focused on the same thought, the quantum noise in detectors around the world is affected by this. So even our quantum theory seems to be you know, showing evidence that the mind and consciousness and paranormal effects you know, alter it in ways we cannot right, right now explain. Well, this is terribly important because harnessing this a big part of harnessing it is recognizing it that it's there, becoming empowered to it. And, you know, you start off your book with a rather remarkable little... I came across remote viewing, uh, and I found out that it was real. Uh, and it blew my mind because it told me that everything I'd learned in school uh, was wrong, was missing some important pieces. And then that sort of started my search, and I was just amazed... Um, the mainstream science is not exposed to the large amount of evidence and the, the number of experiments that are going on around the world. And uh, somehow we have to get uh, better uh, intercommunication between these different uh, you know, parts of our, of our, of our science. Uh, but in ESP, for example, I mean, the, to me, the, some of the strongest work is done by the Princeton uh, Pear Lab. Uh, which is overseen by uh, doctors uh, Brenda Dunn and Robert John. Uh, of course, Bob John used to be head of the engineering department at Princeton, a very distinguished professor. And uh, they have done work for over 20 years on ESP, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of 
cases and experiments uh, with many different uh, participants, and their statistics are you know, billions and, and hundreds of billions to one that this is a real effect. It's not. It's not a fluke. It's not an accident. And that uh, even more remarkably than that, this ESP type phenomena uh, does not weaken with distance, and it seems to even operate forward and backward in time, which is makes it totally unlike any other forces that our science knows about. It's it's more like a uh, it's more like a quantum physical reality than it is something in the sort of ordinary Newtonian world that we live in. And what makes, to my mind, that so interesting is there are experiments taking place in the world of quantum physics now, such as the experiment with entangling entanglement of photons where two photons that have been uh, together can be split apart, and when one of them is exposed to measurement, no matter how far away the other one is, it immediately responds in the same way, meaning that they are linked in some manner that is faster than light and apparently indifferent to distance. Now, I wonder if there's any evidence as to what ESP is, and could it be somehow connected with this phenomenon? 